Hello and welcome to GDIS Global Online Education Series. Uh, today's topic is the soft tissue around dental implants. Uh, this is a very interesting topic that I particularly like myself. Uh, it is, however, uh, quite a poorly understood topic amongst clinicians and many times quite controversial as well. So I would like to spend the next 20 minutes discussing my thoughts, my personal uh, approach to many of the pertinent issues. Uh, I am a dual board certified periodontist for full-time practice, and I am one of the instructors uh, in this organization called Global Dental Implant Academy. What is the function of soft tissue? I guess when we try to understand the implant field, we really should start to understand the soft tissue around natural teeth as a baseline. Soft tissue around teeth serve many functions. First and foremost, it is a part of the apparatus for attachment of teeth to dentition. Within that complex uh, structure, there is immune and defense system that is quite vital to resisting periodontal assaults and other infections and inflammations. It is also, however, a nice drape. It is the outermost uh, layer of the, of the structure. It is a drape and it uh, provides the beauty and the cosmetic aspects of teeth and the surrounding structures. Furthermore, it is an important supply for vasculature that is going to supply not only uh, the vital tissue in the area, but mainly bone, bone that, the alveolar bone that supports the teeth and uh, the housing for that is within the soft tissue drape. Uh, it is therefore nourishing the bone, it keeps the bone from constant remodeling and from uh, being resorted in an unnatural way. So generally speaking, we would like to have abundance of the amount and the type of uh, tissue that's most favorable, that is the keratinized uh, mucosa uh, around teeth and implants for that matter. Too much. Well, too much is sometimes not a good thing. Uh, in this particular case, I have an example of a lady who seeked uh, professional care because of abundance of tissue. This was actually secondary to a gingival grafting attempt, and as a result, it didn't turn out to be so pretty. So she comes back, and over a period of time, uh, I have done multiple surgeries to try to reduce the amount of bulk of the soft tissue, mainly for cosmetics, but also when you have too much soft tissue. That soft tissue gets in the way, it causes what's called pseudo pocket, where bacteria, food debris can be trapped underneath the soft tissue and causing inflammation and the progression of periodontal disease. You see, soft tissue can be classified into two distinct types. I guess it's like being dichotomous, being rich and poor. Uh, it, you're either going to have abundance or thick biotype or you're going to have what's called a thin biotype. And it is clearly demonstrated in a number of recent contemporary studies. Uh, we tend to now understand this field much better than we ever did. The thick biotypes have abundance of blood supply. It tends to preserve the bone and the structure as well, but it has its own side effects, as we mentioned, pseudo pockets and whatnot, sometimes a cosmetic issue. Too little causes more uh, chances and risks for recession as well as overall shrinkage of the tissue with time, with extractions, with other activities. So too much sometimes may not be the best thing. In this situation, too much was a cosmetic issue. As you can see here, what we call the excessive gingival display or the so-called gummy smile is not the most uh, attractive thing in many situations. Uh, it's also called altered passive eruption. Many times patients will seek care just to get rid of this problem. And sometimes it's as easy as using a blade or a laser, any type of cutting instrument to excise the excess tissue away. Many times it requires bone architecture change, meaning it requires full thickness flap and full osseous contouring to change the bony architecture to present soft tissue that is not only harmonious cosmetically, but in function as well. There are pathological issues as well, like this young boy that I had treated a few years ago. This is a medical condition where there is excess tissue, tissue overgrowth, 
uh, it even impedes the eruption of normal T's. And in this situation, the only radical method to treat this, uh, this uh, disorder was to take out the excess, excessive fibrotic tissue as well as the deciduous T's that were uneruptive or not being erupted in a normal fashion. This gingival fibromatosis is a condition many times a surgical intervention is absolutely necessary for that. What about the, the opposite, uh, too little? Mainly in the people with thin biotypes, uh, it is very prone to get gingival recession from as small of a risk as normal tooth uh, brushing function, uh, abrasive food, uh, using eating and using fibrotic food a lot. Many of these uh, issues can lead easily to gingival soft tissue and bone being lost. Uh, this is one of my cases where gingival grafting was done to bring the soft and the hard tissue back on the root surface that was previously exposed. And the uh, root coverage procedures, such as this one, utilizing subepithelial connective tissue grafting, is a very common place in contemporary clinical dentistry. This is yet another case where uh, post-orthodontics, uh, there were severe gingival recession as well as what we define as the mucogingival defect. A mucogingival defect is defined as when there's not enough keratinized tissue or seal effect, which I won't get into. And cases like these are rather predictably treated with many forms of gingival grafting techniques readily available in contemporary dentistry. Yet another case where soft tissue is on the thin side uh, had suffered gradual loss of generalized recession over the years, and this required rather complex intervention by a interdisciplinary team, uh, old case requiring uh, alloderm, uh, platelet-rich fibrin, platelet-rich plasma rather, uh, and full mouth reconstruction using veneers and other modalities. Now, this is a little more contemporary method uh, where mild to moderate recession was treated by a tiny hole, uh, namely the pinhole surgical technique, uh, innovated by John Chow, uh, locally from Southern California. And cases like this, within several weeks, we had magnificent result where the tissue abundance is recreated uh, with rather conservative and very simple surgery. What is important to note here is that gingival recession isn't merely the loss of the gums. That's what many clinicians and lay people think alike. Gingival recession has a much more serious consequence, and that is recession means there's bone loss. So gingival recession equates bone loss. If the bone was not lost, you would not have gingival recession. Another way to look at it is if true gingival recession was purely soft tissue, one should expect to see exposed bone, but that is never the case. Once recession happens, you're not gonna see bone, you're gonna see the root surface, which means Bone loss, bone damage, precedes gingival recession, and that is a cash 22. With not healthy soft tissue, you're going to get gingival recession. With not healthy soft tissue, you're going to get bone loss. So these two types of the biological types, the thick type and the thin type, uh, can have certain implications uh, when it comes to dental implants as well. This is a case where when the patient smiles, uh, it is quite uh, dramatic as to the impact of lack of soft tissue. Uh, a lot of poor decision making was done, implants were placed not in the right position and so forth. This is yet another case where an implant is supposedly clinically successful, but from a cosmetic point of view, it is far from ideal. Yet another case where soft tissue could have been handled better uh, perhaps there's not enough bone, perhaps there's something to do with the uh, positioning of the implant. But these are all nonetheless a soft tissue problem that we have to deal with uh, in order to get the case to be maintainable in the long run. So around dental implants, same concept does appear. In order to preserve bone, which is so vital in the long-term maintenance of dental implants, soft tissue plays a vital role. So let's look at the soft tissue around dental implants briefly. Soft tissue around dental implants behaves rather differently than soft tissue around the natural tooth. This is a cross-section 
of the natural twos. And graphically speaking, we're going to see circumferential uh, fibers. We're going to see the interdental uh, fibers that connect from one tooth to the adjacent tooth. We're also going to see uh, peripheral or 90 degree perpendicular fibers, namely Sharpie's fibers. And in reality, it's a combination, a network of many of these different fibers arranged very, very tightly in a network that allows a soft tissue seal and complex immunosuppressing uh, type of uh, network to be present around each and every tooth. You know, mind you, because a soft tissue junction around the tooth is a major portal for possible invasion of bacteria and foreign body, this is rather a complex uh, structure that was well built uh, in nature. When we try to replicate this with dental implants, we have not the greatest time in doing so. In fact, the earlier implants had this pattern of scarring tissue, and the scar or the fibrotic tissue was body's kind of a desperate attempt to try to seal off around an implant junction. It is uh, supplemented by horizontal and vertical fibers, but nonetheless, it is just not the same and not as complex as in natural tooths. Now, there are many new implant designs do that do a better job, but we'll go into that in just one minute. Once we have a implant soft tissue junction that is imperfect, this is kind of the analogous situation. A little kid that needs tight clothing, but rather has a opening. And in that opening, we can have a lot of things invade, literally come into that area. So a good parent should be fitting a child with you know, in, in harsh weather and environment, tight-fitting clothing, such as a turtleneck. And therefore, we can have this nice seal effect. So this concept of seal has been talked about for many years. I'm talking about a seal, not the animal, this cute guy. When we have seal that's formed around a dental implant, in as early as in the 1950s, our early clinicians, who our forefathers who did implant dentistry realized whether it's a titanium or some kind of a cast implant back in the blade days, they realized good uh, amount of gingival epithelium is quite paramount in uh, getting a good seal and that good seal prevents the onset of inflammation around dental implants. So this is nothing new. This is a concept we've had for you know, more than half a century uh, at this present time. That seal is what we're talking about, to form a nice thick layer of soft tissue around the junction where the implant protrudes, or the abutment protrudes out to the oral cavity. Now, how do we do this? Uh, we'll talk about several different strategies. First of all, do we need attached keratinized tissue? This topic can be quite controversial. And depending on what literature you subscribe to, we can have a very long debate as to whether that's true or not. In general, the, the bulk of the mainstream literature and clinicians, at least in North America, tend to believe there is a consensus for having some attached keratinized tissue of, let's say, two millimeters or more to be on the safe side. Is that same uh, applied to uh, dental implants? And again, argument can be made, but most prominent clinicians and researchers tend to agree that having more attached keratinized tissue is a long-term benefit for dental implants. This two millimeter concept comes from a classic study, uh, a landmark study that was published back in the early 70s. Uh, Klaus Lang and uh, Harold Lowe's paper uh, had shown in a group of dental students that they had studied very well. Their study was quite simple. In a nutshell, what they asked the dental students to do, these are young Swedish Scandinavian dental students who possibly were smokers back in the, the 70s, uh, presumably had good oral hygiene because they were supposedly dental students. But when you measured the amount of inflammation activity as measured by the amount of gingival curvicular fluid activity. They actually measured gingival cur curvicular fluid, and they correlated that data with the amount of true attached gingiva that they found. Remarkably, they found that two millimeters of attached keratinized zone 
was about the threshold. If you had that, you had much less inflammation. If you did not, you had more chances of inflammation proceeding. Therefore, we can deduce from this study that keratinized tissue is a seal and therefore is preventive uh, in, uh, as opposed to inflammation. When you translate that information to dental implants, you can deduce, and many subsequent studies have shown this as evidence that keratinized tissue is a good thing around a clinical dental implant. Let's go into this example where a case that was presented in my practice many years ago had mild to moderate bone loss, if you can call it that. You can see the lack of lamina dura, therefore it is probably within normal limits, depending on how you subscribe to this concept of crestal bone stability. To me, this doesn't look very happy. Well, the clinical symptoms were that the patient actually had pain and discomfort. And the patient could not brush the area well. The patient really had some tough time. Clinically, when it was examined, it was quite evident that there was lack of keratinized tissue on that first molar uh, mandibular implant. And uh, trying to probe and explore the area, the patient found it quite uncomfortable. So the treatment of choice was to try to stabilize this area by giving this person a zone of attached tissue, mainly keratinized tissue. So the treatment modality that was chosen was to take some epithelium, free it up from the palate. That's why we call it free gingival graft. We jokingly say this is an expensive graft. But the free gingival graft, as it's called, was attached and carefully sutured down to the bed. And in a relatively short time, we see this splendid result where the zone of keratinized tissue is firmly attached, is fibrotic, is resisting uh, trauma, physical trauma. The vestibule is a lot deeper, therefore food can be uh, carried into the area without this action of sque uh, squeezing and stretching right at the gingival junction. The patient can brush the area quite readily, and all the symptoms of discomfort disappear literally overnight. So we know from these keratinized tissue uh, and examples that building a good quantity of soft tissue is one of the keys in uh, soft tissue management or the principles of managing soft tissue around a, nat uh, a natural tooth and uh, much more so around a dental implant. And just like how we want to do wealth management to plan your retirement in a most uh, efficient way, what do you do? You save up and you put it away, put away part of your wealth, and then once you get there, you make sure it's preserved and it multiplies. So the actual way we want to manage this is to preserve the quantity and the quality. The quantity of soft tissue helps because the more the amount of soft tissue, in general, the better the blood supply. And therefore, the better the blood supply will make sure that the bone underneath will get good nourishment and tend to last longer. And the quantity and quality of the tissue, not movable, not stretchable, but firm, fibrotic, almost leathery-like keratinized tissue is thought to be the ideal tissue that we want around a dental implant. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the types of dental implant connection that is out there. We went through a period of generally external hex to the internal Morse taper to internal hex type of some connection. We've had a variety of different connections that were introduced in our field over the decades uh, of implant dentistry. Today, I believe uh, the conical seal, the conical type of connection with an offset where there is this supposed, uh, many like people like to call it platform switching concept, tends to give us much better soft tissue seal than any other type of connection out there. And that's generally the case. So if we combine this concept of getting good quantity and quality of tissue, combine that with a nice implant connection that doesn't have a lot of opening, that has a nice seal, that tend to encourage bone growth at the crest of the implant, that seems to be one of the best strategies we can think about in contemporary implant dentistry. Thank you for attending our uh, global online education series. Uh, like us on Facebook 
And if you'd like any feedback or communication, I can be reached at drkim at drjimkim.com. That's my personal email. If you would like to contact the organization, uh, please uh, contact this uh, email, info at gdia.com, for further information uh, on many of the programs that we offer. Thank you very much.